you know, the width profile then, so the width profile, you can use a method called, and, and what, what this, I'm just going to sort of present a partial result, but the result comes from the boundary element formulation of the solid mechanics. So the solid mechanics being the rock, right, the deformation of the rock, okay, and the rock is modeled as, you know, the crack is modeled as a, you know, a crack in an infinite medium. And uh, so then there's a couple of papers, uh, Hearth, Sixty-eight, uh, Brewery, nineteen seventy-seven. That showed that you know the width, and notice this is a function of x and y, right? So this this is some some arbitrary planar fracture that has x and y variations. This is the width variation. Okay, uh, it's a function of an integral over the surface. Like that, so the, the primes are the dummy variables in integration, and if you recognize this, this is the so-called convolution integral. So the, the way you might say that we're this is, you know, convolving the net pressure inside, and that's a pressure distribution, right? So it can be non-uniform with some function f, and the function f, uh, let's just call it a, an elastic influence function. So F is an elastic influence function. And as for right now, we'll just leave it at that. Because sort of to come up with these is beyond the scope of the class to derive one. Let's just assume I'll give it to you. Right? All right, so that's that sort of addresses the the width given the pressure. And and also the shape, right? The shape is implicit in that, in that we're integrating over the surfaces, right? So we're assuming at this moment we know the shape, right? It's the, the surfaces of the extents of the fracture, right? In the x and y direction. So it's the extents of the fracture. So we're integrating it. So that's that's the width given the net pre the pressure distribution and the extents of the fractures. The extents of the fractures, we could use something like the displacement discontinuities to determine when they're going to grow, right? Uh, we talked about the, that last time. And so then let's talk about the fluid mechanics, okay? Um, you know, all, uh, have you had transport? All of you had transport? So, I mean, this will probably be reviewed. We can simplify the sort of conservation of mass equation in this case because we, if we know the width, um, then conservation of mass is just the density times the width times the velocity in the x direction plus the density times the width times the velocity in the y direction plus in this in this case we'll include a, a leak off term so th this is your, you know, this is a, a, if you had Dr. Bauhoff or Dr. Lick, they probably talk about in, uh, for reservoir one or two, and they say, you know, N minus out equals accumulation, right? Those are the, you know, this is your accumulation term, this is your out term, and then this is the, the variation along the along the crack, fracture. Right, so that's your conservation of mass equation. I'm going to do something. I'm going to present something a little different. We'll talk about momentum. Um, 
probably different than what you've seen. What's, what's the equation that governs, the, the most general equation that governs the momentum of a fluid? There's a name for it. Navier-Stokes equations, right? Uh, that's too hard for me to remember exact form of the Navier-Stokes equation. So it's all conservation of momentum. And before, you know, well, certainly before Stokes, um, uh, you know, Kochi formulated the most general form of the conservation of momentum. And we've already used it in this class. We use it for solid mechanics, right? And another reason I like to present it this way because it sort of unifies the mechanics. I mean, conservation of momentum is conservation of momentum, momentum. It doesn't matter if it's a fluid or a solid, okay? So we, we've already used it in this class. Right? So this is mass. So for momentum, yeah, width. Yeah. And it's a function of x and y. Right? So for momentum, we've already seen it in this class. I might have wrote, it's in the notes when we talked about, you know, elasticity, and I might have written it out um, in the three equations, you know, x, y, and z. But in vector form, we can write this equation like like this. This is just Newton's second law. F equals MA, right? So if I multiply this whole thing by velocity, I mean by a volume, but if I multiply this by a volume of any element, right? I have density times volume, that's mass. Mass times the derivative of, velo of velocity, that's acceleration. Time derivative of velocity, that's acceleration. So mass times acceleration. So this must be the sum of the forces, right? And that's what it is. I mean, if you look at the units, there's, this is a force per unit volume. I multiply by volume, I get force. Right? This is a body force density. So if I multiply it by, by you know, this has units of, uh, well, it's, um, what is it? Uh, meters per second squared. So this is like gravity. It's a body force. Okay, so so how do we get to the fluid equations, right? Well, the first thing you might notice, you know, I think when I wrote these out for a solid, I wrote the second time derivative. You know, solids were usually interested in the displacement. Fluids were interested in the velocity. Right? So, you know, I could I could have easily written, you know, the velocity is the time derivative of displacement. So. When I, if you go back and look at the notes, I probably had like partial squared u partial t squared. Right? So the second derivative of displacement with respect to time. This one I wrote it in terms of velocity because in fluids we solve the unknown is velocity. Okay, and that's because you know typically fluids don't have a history. They don't. I mean that's not exactly true. You have you can have viscoelastic fluids and other things, but typically. Fluids sort of behave the same no matter where they've been. Right? And the, the motion of a fluid at any point can be determined by the, the quantities at that point in the current time, the thermodynamic quantities, right? the pressure, the temperature, and other things. Okay. So I wrote this a little bit differently. I used this big D dt, and that's something we call the material time derivative. Okay. So the material time derivative. This is an operation, if you will. So whatever is there, in this case it's V, but whatever is there is equal to the partial time derivative of whatever is there plus V times grad whatever is there. Right? So in this case, I just whatever, you know, those those braces just mean put whatever, you know, in this case it would just be the velocity, right? But you could also write the material time derivative for density and many other things. 
And what this is, what this is, is this is the velocity of that an observer would, would, would feel or see riding along with the fluid. So whereas the, the normal time derivative is the, is the velocity or the change, the change in velocity in this case. This is the change in velocity with respect to time that a, that a stationary observer would see. Right? And you may wonder what, what the difference is. And I have a, a clever sort of thought experiment for you. Um, I stole this from some guy on YouTube. Right? I, I, I used to use a, a nozzle as an example of how to explain this, and I never, I, I never felt like anybody really understood what I was talking about. So I was like, well, how? I went online. You know, how, how is other people describing what the material time derivative is? And so uh, there was a guy on YouTube that gave a good little analogy. So unfortunately, I should have wrote down his name uh, so I could give him proper credit. I didn't. So thank you to the guy that I'm stealing this uh, from. So uh, let's imagine that, to help you understand what this material time derivative is and, and why there's sort of two separate definitions of, of a time derivative, right? Um, let's imagine that there's a river. And on the bank of the river, is a factory. And one day that factory, um, so the factory, you know, sucks up and, uh, and, and deposits fluid into, into the river, water. Okay, and, and one day uh, there's some malfunction in the plant and there's a spill into the river. So some contaminants now in the river. And the river, by the way, is obviously flowing with some velocity. Okay? So now you're an engineer and I tell you to go out and measure the, the concentration of that contaminant in the river. So there's two ways to do that. Right? One way would be to go stand on the shore. So there you are. And you have a long stick and you stick it out there and you measure the concentration. Right. And if you do that, if you measure the concentration there and you were to say plot it from the shore, right, so I'll come up here, come up here and I'll say, you know, this is the velocity versus time, I'm, I'm sorry, this is the concentration versus time measured from the shore. What you would measure is, I mean, you, you put the stick right in there, right? And you're just going to measure basically some constant concentration. Let, let's assume that the, the plant is continuously spilling. Right? The spill hasn't been contained. So it's continually dumping fluid into the, into the water there. And you're measuring it. And you're just going to measure a constant, right? You're standing on the bank with the fluid. The other way you might measure it is to get in a boat. So you get in a boat, and so there you are. And now you stick your stick in the boat in the water, and you drive through, or in this case, not drive through, but you just float along with velocity, right, with the water. You just float along, and you pass through. You pass through the concentration, and you measure it. Right? And th that case, so this is from the shore. Right? This, is the, this, is, this is from the boat. So in that case, you, you, know, you, you began with time 
you didn't measure no concentration because you haven't gotten to the plume yet. And then once you hit the plume and pass through it, you'd see a little blip in the concentration. Now, both of these are correct measurements. They're both correct. It's just the interpretation of, are you moving with the fluid, or are you standing stationary? Mm -hmm. And this is what the material time derivative basically is. If, if you're moving with the fluid, this is the, this is the, so there you have to account for the velocity of the fluid and the fact that you're moving with the fluid. So if we, in this example, if you're actually measuring concentration, the thing in the, you know, right here, So the material time derivative of the concentration would be this. Right? And this V is the velocity of the water. So that's sort of an example of what the material time derivative is. Okay? So if you like, then you know this is our Cauchy momentum equation. It's the one equation that governs the momentum of anything, right? any continuous thing solid or fluid. So if you like then, we can rewrite that thing using this, the expanded version of the material time derivative. So now we'll have rho partial v partial t plus v red v equals the divergence of stress plus, and now we'll assume that the only body force is gravity. Right? So the only, only body force is gravity, so then we're going to have rho g. All right. So then what's our stress? Well, stress, we have to come up with a constitutive model. Right? So a stress, basically a relationship between, you know, in, in solid mechanics we talk about a relationship between uh, stress and strain as a constituent model. In fluid mechanics, we typically talk about a relationship. Stress is related to the rate, or the, the rate of strain, if you will, <laughs> or it's it's the velocity strain. Okay, so it has to do with the motion. And so, the constituent model then we'll use is that the stress, and it's a tensor, right? It's nine components, is equal to the shear stress, which I haven't defined yet, also a tensor, minus the pressure times the identity matrix. Okay. So then now we need an additional constituent model for the shear stress. Then the shear stress is equal to um, shear stress is equal to two mu. Mu is the viscosity of the fluid times, I'll just call it D, that's a tensor also, that's the velocity strain or the rate of strain, plus one-third times the divergence of V. So this is a constituent model. So once somebody proposed it, and it seems to represent fluid mechanics pretty well. Okay. Now we're going to specialize a little bit. Basically, if I plug that tau back into that guy, and then I take the divergence of the whole thing, then I have the fully incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. Okay. We're going to specialize to. I'm sorry, the fully compressible. Navier-Stokes equation. We're going to specialize to the incompressible case. The incompressible case, if you if you remember, uh, incompressible. Another w way to say that is divergence-free. Remember that from transport. There's no divergence of the velocity field in the incompressible fluid. Okay. So this is the divergence, right? Remember this gradient. Or you probably don't like my vector. Yeah, because it's, it's divergence-free. That means it's zero, right? And that's what we're about to do. Because usually, usually 
So we're going to say that's zero, right? So now we have incompressible fluid. So then the last thing I have to do is just define what the rate of strain is, or the velocity of strain, and that's one half grad V plus grad V transpose. Or if you want to write out the components, the IJ component would be one half partial VI partial XJ plus partial VJ partial XI, where I and J are equal to one, two, and three. Right. So that gives us a tensor. Right. So the so the one one component of the matrix then would be V1 X1, V1 X1. So that would be two V1 X1 times two. So then it would just be V1 X1. So now, so that's that's actually. I'm not, I, I guess I won't write it out, but let's just say if I plug that into that equation and that into that equation and that into the equation at the top and write it all out, I have the Navier-Stokes equation for incompressible flow. And the incompressible flow, I have to maintain that this divergence-free condition holds. So there's a supplemental equation to the Navier-Stokes equation for incompressible flow. This is a constraint on the flow. Right? So it all, it's just conservation of momentum. It's exactly what we learned for solid mechanics earlier in the class. It's just, we can get, you know, it's just really no different. Coaching momentum equation, you just plug some things in and you get to the Navier-Stokes equation. So now we're gonna, we, we're, we wanna, talk about really, we can model the fluid flow in a narrow channel or a fracture, right, as sort of one dimensional, right? The fluid is just going to move that way, right? Now, it can have some variation in, it can have some variation in the height, or at least initially we'll assume that, but the fluid is just going to move that way, okay? So it's not going to move, you know, there's not going to be any component of velocity in, in any other direction except x. So the velocity component in the y direction will be zero. The velocity component in the z direction will be zero. Okay. So if two of the velocity components are zero, and this divergence-free condition holds, right, so let me just write out what that is in terms of x, y, and z. Right. So divergence, the divergence operator is like partial partial x, v x plus partial partial y. Vy plus partial partial z vz equals zero, right? And I just told you we're, we're now we're going to one-dimensional flow, right? So 1d flow. In one-dimensional flow, the velocity in the y and the z direction is zero, right? So if the velocity in the y and the z direction is zero, those two terms go away. And it gives me an additional thing that says that the, the, the rate of change of the velocity in the x direction with respect to x is zero. And so with all of that then, if I plug everything that I just talked about, you know, basically this back into the Navier-Stokes equations, the fact that two of the velocity components are zero and this divergence-free condition, if I plug all that in, it reduces to this. So this is for a channel x, y with a width 
like that. Okay. We can actually solve this equation. You know there's a million dollar prize if you can solve the Niger Stokes equation? If you can solve a general, if you can have a, come up with a general solution to the incompressible Niger Stokes equation, you can win a million bucks. It's one of the mathematical grand challenges. Well, we're going to do it for the 1D. Unfortunately, that doesn't count. So you can solve that equation in 1D, and the solution then, uh, I'm sorry, this should be Vx. So the solution And of course, we know this, right? So to solve this, you have to assume that the no slip condition, so that the velocity at the edges are zero. And then you get this parabolic profile, right? So in the y direction, there's a, it's a you know, y, this is a per equation of a parabola, right? So you have a per parabolic profile there. And so then you can just integrate that over y to get an average velocity in the x direction. Now, does it, what does this equation look like? Just imagine that I replaced w squared over 12 with k. I called k equal w, 12, w squared over 12. It looks like Darcy's law. And so how do we use Darcy's law? We plug that into the velocity in the conservation of mass equation so that we get <coughs> an equation and we do some simplification so we get equation that's all in terms of pressure. And so this is what we can do here in this thin, thin chain. So now we have something, you know, we have something, this is called Reynolds, Reynolds lubrication theory, right? So we have something that we can plug back into the conservation of mass equation, make some other assumptions about slightly compressible fluids and all that, and essentially then we get a diffusivity equation that, you know, that instead of having the, you know, straight up Darcy's law, the permeability tensor, then we have this, and that governs the, you know, we can we can then solve the conservation of mass in terms of pressure in in the fracture. 